Now let's uh, talk about another dimension that we can utilize to address the challenges of integrating uh, renewables and EVs into the grid, which is the ability to have much more flexible demand or flexibilizing the demand. So just to recap, you know, when you uh, match supply to demand in the grid, we schedule power at different time scales. Uh, the figure here shows that the demand is met by a combination of base generation and reserves, uh, which are, you know, in the traditional grid was, was mostly fossil fuels. You know, these reserves exist because you schedule power according to predictions. And so you have some reserves to, to, to match the supply. Uh, when you add renewables, you know, you're able to replace some of the base load, but you have to add additional reserves. And uh, we discussed how, you know, energy storage and better forecasting can potentially reduce these reserves. But um, energy storage is, is still going to be an expensive technology and forecasting uh, has uh, its limits, you know, based on the amount of sensing and information that you have available. So what else could you do? So one idea is that if you could actually operate loads more flexibly, meaning you could schedule the loads, you could potentially schedule them when uh, renewables are available, significantly reducing the needs for reserves. So adding demand flexibility reduces reserves, which enables effective decarbonization. But in order to have this demand flexibility, you need to coordinate a lot of these so-called distributed energy resources, which are resources that sit behind the customer meters. And typically, these are not very large resources. So to have an impact in the overall grid, you have to have a coordination of large numbers of these resources. In order to understand this, we have to start by understanding uh, traditional consumers. So, you know, traditionally, consumers utilize resources according to preferences. Here I just show, you know, a typical home, but this also happens at commercial customers, etc. And you can see you have various appliances, refrigerator, oven, radio, DVD player, TV. You have... Um, water pump in your home you have a water heater potentially that's an electric water heater you have your hvac furnace lighting washing machine and dryer and they're all connected to the panel and uh, you have a meter that measures the total consumption of power that's happening in this home in this panel typically you know we only had observability of consumption at this meter level and uh, resources were not connected, which meant there was no real way to influence and automate the moment when some of these appliances are actually operating while respecting consumer preferences. But this landscape is changing significantly. First of all, you know, as we discussed before, because of uh, the adoption of electric vehicles, um, we also have the adoption of smart appliances, you know, the appliance itself can have an intelligence or, for example, your smart thermostat. And customers are now not just consuming electricity, but they can also potentially generate electricity. And as I mentioned earlier, all of these technologies are connected to the cloud. And this cloud is being used to basically collect data and do some analytics on on optimizing locally what you do. So we have a collection of consumers with connected distributed energy resources at the grid edge, including solar, storage, EVs, and smart appliances. But today, DERs are mostly uncoordinated. That is, they don't operate together towards adding demand flexibilities. Of course, there are some exceptions. For example, within some homes or commercial buildings with solar and storage, there is coordination to store excess solar power and use it when electricity prices from the grid are high. Also, um, there exist some demand response programs. 
which are operated by utility companies that aim to control uh, HVACs or air conditioning and other large electricity consuming devices to reduce peak demand on the grid a few days of the year. Uh, finally, the DR vendors themselves, you know, individually, like a smart thermostat company, solar storage, they operate these private clouds for their own devices, um, and, but they are mostly used to collect data from the devices and send software updates and not to control the devices or coordinate their operation across different consumers. So why should we have this uh, DR coordination? Well, DR coordination can certainly help address these 21st century grid challenges. Uh, in particular, you know, by coordinating DRs across customers, we can reduce the overloading of transformers or the demands on the uh, peak hours in the grid due to solar and EV charging by using storage and load control. We can reduce electricity costs to consumers by having them consume more when renewables are high. We can address the duck curve, curtailment, and intermittency through the aggregation of resources. By aggregating all these resources together and managing them intelligently, we can have, again, the load follow renewables, not just supply follows demand, but supply and demand meet each other. Finally, the coordination can ensure the grid becomes a lot more resilient against grid failures, including those caused by climate change. For example, you can store power and utilize it for critical services during moments of extreme weather events. But the air coordination is challenging because of uh, a, a variety of uh, critical issues. First of all, no one entity can access all of these resources, you know. So each node or each customer has access only to its own data. Each DR provider has access only to its own devices. So for example, a residential customer has access to its own data, including the meter data, but the DR provider that installs a solar system in your rooftop or to the EV, EV charger in your garage has only access to its, its own device and its own data. Uh, the utility only has access to the meter data and the distribution grid information, but not to the data of the DRs. And finally, all the DR owners require autonomy. They wanna use these DRs in the way they see fit. Okay, so what this means is that this precludes this idea of a centralized and uh, coordination or even an idea of a fully distributed coordination. So you cannot have a centralized agent because not one agent has all of the information and a fully distributed um, system is also not possible because, you know, different uh, uh, pieces of information are somewhat centralized, you know, so DR providers and utilities own significant pieces of information. So what can you do? So instead of uh, relying either on a centralized or on a fully distributed system, we can start to think about new architectures for coordination that can mediate between the different agents that participate in the demand side, including utilities, DR providers, and consumers. And here in the next slide, we're able to see how these different agents interact with each other. So you can see that consumers have the consumer resources. They engage with utilities and with aggregators, for example, DR providers. And the utilities and aggregators engage with the markets and they can exchange information with consumers in different ways uh, and form a totally new ecosystem. In this new ecosystem, we are blurring the very traditional meter divide, which said everything that's behind a meter is consumer only, 
Everything that's in front of the meter is utilities only, and there is not even room necessarily for the role of an aggregator. Um, in this new design of the system or manner of operating the system, um, there is a blurring of these roles of consumers, utilities, and aggregators. And we have a much more complex ecosystem that involves consumers, vendors, aggregators, utilities, generator companies, investors, and regulators. And we need to address the technology, policy, and business models to enable this coordination. So for example, today, one of the limitations is that if I inject power back into the grid um, and that power is utilized by someone else, um, there is no mechanism necessarily um, that credits the power from one customer to the next. This is not a technology limitation, it's just a policy limitation. In rural areas in the US, we have allowed such credit, but not in urban areas. And such a credit would enable transactions between customers to take place in this distribution grid. So the, the challenges you know, to establish these new coordination mechanisms, um, as we saw, have to do with information and autonomy. And just looking a little bit more deeply, you know, kind of addressing this problem of coordination of, of distributed energy resources requires answering three very important questions. One, any system that is set up to support coordination cannot be fully centralized, cannot be fully decentralized, so it has to be something in, in between, uh, but it has to understand and uh, prioritize uh, consumer preferences and their behaviors. So how do we learn that in a way that preserves privacy and uh, uh, offers the, 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 the best benefits to the consumer? Second, uh, we have to make it very attractive and easy for consumers to engage in this coordination exercise so that uh, we can um, have the coordination happen at scale. Uh, and third, we need to understand when we have all of this set up, can this really be scaled up? Can we coordinate tens of thousands of consumers? So we did a project at Stanford. We have been doing a project at Stanford called PowerNet, which is a cloud-based ER coordination platform. In this project, we partnered with Google, Sonin, and SunTech Drive to design a coordination system that spans all the way from behind the meter into the cloud and the connection to the wholesale markets. The system has several components as shown in the figure here. First, we have a smart panel that can measure at very high resolution what's happening in terms of consumption. And uh, we have a local hub for every consumer that is able to digitally communicate with various uh, distributed energy resources, you know, EV uh, charging, storage, and solar, as well as with the smart panel and uh, power electronics in the smart panel that allows you to control power consumption. This local hub uh, is a computer and it's able to use this communication capability to optimize and schedule all the loads in order to minimize the customer's bill. This hub communicates with the cloud and through that communication, it can actually opt to participate in coordination to provide services to the grid. For example, hubs can join together to shave peak power or they can join together to respond to wholesale market prices. So the system is designed in the way to address the main challenges of coordination. First of all, in the local hub, it is able to uh, learn consumer preferences and incorporate them in the decision of when to participate in coordination. Second, the uh, coordination is designed to take into account the constraints of the power network, the physics constraints of the power network. Third, the coordination is designed as a hierarchical architecture without centralized control, where 
information is provided dynamically to the hubs that then decide whether they want to engage in a particular coordination event or not. And fourth, um, the whole system was uh, designed to scale and incorporate the different types of storage, EV, solar, um, and very large numbers of consumers by ensuring that, uh, you know, just the a sufficient amount of data is exchanged and that the whole system is very robust to communication failures and limitations. This system was uh, kind of first built in the PowerNet lab, which is a lab that was put together by Stanford graduate students. It has uh, two homes, you know, one home you can see all the appliances here. It has a Tesla power wall. It has a rooftop solar. Um, all of these uh, technologies are connected to this box that you see in the, in the right-hand side picture, um, which basically emulates the distribution and transmission grid. These two homes are connected there, and they're connected uh, digitally to 9,998 other homes to form a 10,000 home strong grid um, where we can simulate the impacts of all of these uh, uh, coordination um, systems in uh, real time and incorporate all the constraints, you know, including power network constraints, communication constraints, and consumer preference constraints. The first place that PowerNet was deployed was in a Central Valley uh, dairy farm where we focused on the behind the meter um, coordination aspect of PowerNet and uh, this uh, Central Valley dairy farm is one of the largest dairy farms in the um, US and it has about uh, 12,000 cows housed in 10 freestall barns. The electricity uh, demand in the dairy farm is quite high. The farm consumes a large amount of electricity both in terms of energy and peak power. It's uh, consuming 2.7 gigawatt of electricity per year with a peak demand of 700 kilowatts during the summer. Ventilation in the barns is necessary to maintain the cow's health and they constitute about 60% of the total consumption during the summer months. Um, electricity to the farm is quite expensive and uh, it's charged according to time of day, season, and monthly peak demand. The farmer spends approximately $104,000 per month in electricity, which is a significant fraction of this operating cost. And uh, adding, we will show that, you know, adding DR coordination at the farm can significantly help reduce these costs as well as carbon uh, emissions from electricity. DR Installation and coordination in a farm is challenging. The farm is an uncontrolled environment with variable and extreme climate conditions and resources are spread over long distances. The farm has little or no existing communication infrastructure. The main loads in the dairy farm are motors used for example in ventilation which consume significant amounts of power. They impose several additional complexities for coordination including you know, having to handle system stability challenges. They issue that motors are typically operating in multiple phases of the electricity system. And finally, controlling loads and resources requires significant sensing, including power, weather, and very application specific, such as um, animal health. So, we focused our field deployment of PowerNet on ventilation because, as I mentioned before, it kind of accounts for 60% of the farm energy consumption during the summer months. Ventilation in this farm uses evaporative cooling, which involves spraying water on the animals while turning on the fans. This is done when the ambient temperature exceeds 22 degrees Celsius. Each barn has 30 fans and uses 39 kilowatts of power for 16 plus hours per day. The behind the meter system we installed consists of several physical resources as well as parts of the PowerNet coordination software that I mentioned. 
A variable frequency drive was installed for each fan to allow us to control the speed of the fans. You can see here shown in orange. The solar 1.6 kilowatt solar panels were installed for each fan to ensure that uh, most of the power supply to the fans was coming from renewables. Sensor networks for temperature, humidity and wind speed were installed in a weather sensor network and the power sensor network was installed so that um, it can measure all of the power consumption and production in the system. And finally, the PowerNet cloud software was linked to all of the resources and a behind the meter control implemented in it that incorporates algorithms for modeling cooling, forecast resources, and optimize accordingly. Here you can see in these pictures each specific resource and system, you know, the sensors for temperature and humidity, the frequency drives controlling these large fans, a battery storage system installed in the test barn, and then the barn control room. As a result of coordinating and optimally operating this system, we were able to reduce the electricity cost by 92% by coordinating fan, solar, and battery. But just using fan and solar, we are able to reduce it by 81%. And by just using fan alone, we are able to reduce it by 52%. So energy efficiency, which is just the use of fan alone, can reduce carbon emissions. But when it's coupled with solar and battery, you can nearly eliminate all carbon emissions as shown here. So fan alone, you have 50% carbon reduction. Fan and solar, you have 84% uh, carbon reduction. So we only have 16% carbon left. And fan, solar, and battery, just 7% carbon uh, left.